please welcome the most trusted man in America, Phil Donahue! Thank you. You made it. You made it, bro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good. Well, hello, Wisconsin. Oh, oh, man, I wouldn't miss this for anything. Oh, my goodness. Let me look at you. So you're the people who hate America. You're the people who think a man ought to be able to marry a Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> You're against traditional marriage. I don't know why I am seen in public with you. Somebody may take my picture. This is what they have done to us. And by the way, we stood there while it was happening. We just don't get it. We don't under... The next time somebody tells us that we don't love America, we're going to say, hell, we love it better than you do. We believe in the Bill of Rights. If, if you put the Bill of Rights to a vote in this crowd, it would pass. You know, we can't be certain about those in power now. They believe that all men are created equal unless we're scared. We had just this past week the vice presidential nominee talk about prisoners' rights with disdain. I mean contempt. How dare you worry about a prisoners' rights. This is only the fundamental bedrock of this nation, and it's being dismissed now as not important. We have to stop this right now. Well, first things first, Marlo Thomas is raising Marlo Thomas is a, as you must know, the number one fundraiser for the hospital founded by her father. Danny Thomas founded St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And when I married Marlo in 1980, I married a hospital. My father-in-law at my wedding said, I haven't lost a daughter, I've gained a fundraiser. And on many occasions, I shared a dais with my father-in-law, who passed in 1991. And I used to tell audiences as he sat there with the cigar, I used to say, you know, people are always comparing me and my father-in-law. We have so much in common. I was born in Cleveland, a city on Lake Erie. My father-in-law was born in Toledo. We both married the most beautiful woman in the world, and we each have received many honors. My father-in-law was knighted by two popes, and I recently was named Man of the Year by transvestites for a better America. <laughs> well, We now believe, we now, we have to be honest and say that we gather here in this beautiful af pre-fall afternoon in Wisconsin. What a jewel in the Midwest is this state. We gather at a time when our nation is in a very, fragile place. We've had 
thousands of people go to war on foreign battlefields in past years to defend our way of life. At the center of this way of life is free speech. And if a president is calling a war, we are told to shut up and sing. If you can't dissent against a war at a time that a president is calling one, then why did we send all those people to those foreign fields to die in the dirt and the sand? Stop wasting their blood. Don't send them anymore. We'll get, we can have any kind of country we want. We'll get a Neil Mussolini and he'll decide what's good for us. I mean, I believe there are, there are millions of people in this country, God-fearing, proud Americans, patriotic, law-abiding, who believe in their soul. That to criticize a president at a time he's calling a war is indefensible, unpatriotic, and shows that you don't love the troops. And this situation is killing our young adults. It is way too easy for a president of the United States to go to war. We've seen this now. And let me talk about the work that John Nichols has been doing, along with Robert McChesney and a lot of very hardworking Americans. John Nichols and Robert McChesney and so many other people who are working hard on, in, in media reform believe that corporate media is ruining democracy. We need no more proof. Imagine, imagine every major metropolitan newspaper in this country supported this war. Every one. That's what you get with corporate media. Being against the war was not good for business. Think of what the president had going for him. First of all, he engaged in the politics of fear. Saddam has risen toxins, Saddam has aflatoxins, Saddam has this, Saddam has that. He's outside your bedroom window, he's, in your, he's under your bed. <laughs> Honest to God, they, they brilliantly staged the politics of fear, and this president took this nation by the ear and led it right into the sword. And making matters worse, as this power group chipped away at the bedrock of our democracy, no habeas corpus, people in a cage for five years, no phone calls, no Red Cross, no nothing, going through your emails. While all this was happening, the majority of the American people stood mute. You know, having just spent three and a half years trying to tell the story of a young man who signed up 913, wanted to go get the evildoers, and immediately wanted to know why he was going to Iraq. He's at Fort Hood in Basie. Why am I going to Iraq? Too late now. He's there, five days. Bullet comes down, exits T4 on the spine between the shoulder blades here, and he's paralyzed from the chest down. You know, as I stood next to his bed in Walter Reed Army Medical Center, you can't help but think what this experience has done for all of us who've worked on this film, including my co-director and partner, Ellen Spiro. What we've come to appreciate more than ever before is the brilliance and the vision of the framers. The framers were right. Only Congress can declare war. Don't give this power to one man. And if, if, if you give a president a cruise missile, he'll fire it. Norman Solomon makes this point in a book titled War Made Easy. What he, his point is, that if, a, if an American president wants a war, he can have one. We will stand there and let him go ahead. Oh, there'll be voices out there that'll say, wait a minute, but you won't see them on corporate media. You don't see Iraq vets against the war. You don't see veterans for peace. 
You don't see Peace Now members on the morning talk shows on Sunday. You see the, you see the glitterati. You see the, the cabinet members, all those powerful people in Washington. But the people, the people, you know the, the word in the Constitution, we the people, are not really heard. That's another thing you get with corporate media. That's why the work that John is doing is so very, very important. We have to change this. If we don't, it's going to happen again. We're and let's remember something else. You don't get a statue in a park for fixing health care. You don't get a statue in the park for fixing global warming. You only get a statue for going to war. That's why our parks are filled with swords and horses and shields. Our children play on cannons in parks all across this nation. I mean, how can we expect, how can we be surprised that we have become a rootin' tootin' shootin' belligerent nation? We are dropping bombs on crowded cities at night where old people and children are sleeping and we're watching it on CNN. This is the reality of the... America has become a militaristic warrior nation. And we can't be surprised by this. We are... We are spending $500 billion a year on things that go boom. And that doesn't count the war. The war is $145, $150 billion supplemental. Do the math. We're coming up on $650, $660. That's $2 billion a day. How, can, how could we have allowed this to happen? You can't spend that kind of money and not use the things that go boom. If you don't use them, the American people might start to think we don't really need them, and there goes the industrial profit for building an aircraft carrier. Out the window. We're building aircraft carriers, and 19 guys with box cutters brought this nation to its knees. We are... We are, well, it's a good thing we've got some extra voices here, after all. This is, this, is an, this is an assembly of people of conscience who welcome all views. But let's not miss the point here. We spend too much. It draws us into conflict. Our aggressive, rootin', tootin', shootin', foreign policy trickles down to our local constabulary. Police are now more aggressive. And didn't you feel safer when Amy Goodman was finally arrested? <laughs> and did you see, and did you see that cop with a gun pointing at the cameraman? Hey. That's a cop who does not understand this great Republican experiment in democracy called the USA. He really feels he has the authority to shut that camera. I mean, there are nations in this world that take that kind of leaders who take that kind of power to themselves. These are the nations where you find dissenters in shallow graves. This is the creeping militarism that has paralyzed this nation and put our children at risk. And there's nobody else out there that's going to stop this except us. And we are, to, we will be joined by millions of other people who believe as we do. The time is now, the emergency is now. And the nominees for getting this job done are us. We can do it. We have been marginalized for way too long and we've kept far too quiet. 
while all this terrible invective has come down on our heads. And then the final coup de grace, by the way, they, you, you don't have God and they do. You know? And by the way, let's talk about the framers one more time. They were right. The separation of church and state is critical to the success of this democracy. They were right. They know what's good for us. They talk to Jesus every day, and Jesus talks back. <laughs> this is why we want a separation of church and state. We don't want this kind of messianic personality in our White House. You will never catch us tripping over our robes to God bless this and God bless that. God bless my dog. God bless my cat. Oh, sit down with this false piety. We've had enough of it. God has to be up there looking down and saying, Oi. Oh, please, talk to the person on the bus. Stop talking to me. Make this world a better place. Our faith comes from in here. It is personal to us. It is important to us. It is one of the most sublime features of the lives of millions of people. And we live in a country that allows us to express it as we choose from our heart. But please don't beat me over the head with your message about how much I need to be saved. I will take care of that. Let's you and I walk forward and make this country a better place. Just, just one story I want to share with you about. You know, when they say that we don't love America, we, prob we have a responsibility to tell them why we do. And one of, the reason, one of the reasons I am a proud American has to do with the story of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember I used to pass Kingdom Hall as a kid, and I think, boy, those little people are weird. You know, I'm in the Catholic Church, they're in this little, you know. And who are they? Who are these people? You know, Catholics go to Mass, Jews go to temple and synagogue, Islamic uh, faith people go to mosques. Jehovah's Witnesses go door to door. <laughs> and they drive everybody crazy. The cops used to meet them when they came into town along with the townsfolk, and they beat him. They beat him. There is no overstating the contempt that the majority of the people in this nation had for the Jehovah's Witnesses. They would not salute the American flag. Their faith allows them only to offer their allegiance to the God King Jehovah and nothing else, not the flag, nothing. And in the fifth grade, in West Virginia, when the children stood, there was a young, young ch kid by the name, this is fifth grade, his name is William Gobitis, and he was a witness. And when the whole class stood and offered, I pledge allegiance to the flag, the witness kids went, stood like this, and the teacher would come along, and a little William Gobitis, held on to the pockets of his britches to keep that arm from going up. We threw stones at these kids. We had Americans dying in the, in the Pacific as well as the European theater. And these kids wouldn't salute the flag. This is 1940, 41. We hated these. They were scum. 
We, there, we killed a guy in, in, in uh, Iowa. They burned down Kenny, uh, Kingdom Hall in Kennebunk, Maine. They put a rope around the witnesses and marched them through downtown Wheeling, West Virginia. All the churches called for a boycott. These people had to homeschool. They had no money because their businesses were going broke because of, and they kept on to their faith, and those kids would not salute the flag. There were two Supreme Court decisions. The first one said, you gotta salute. You gotta salute, and if you don't salute, and this, and this public school expels you, not suspend, expels you, that school has a right to do that. There were a thousand injuries following that decision, and a little more than a year later, the court took the case back. And finally, Robert Jackson, a progressive if there ever was one, a member of the Supreme Court, said this on behalf of the majority. One of the great flourishes in the history of the court. Here's what he said with these little kids sitting there. Great, in the great atrium of the court. If there is any fixed star, we want to we keep this in mind when all these religionists come and tell us how inferior we are because we're not a member of their faith. Robert Jackson, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, may prescribe what shall be orthodox in religion, politics, nationalism, or any other matters of opinion, nor may he force by word or day, deed, a belief therein, you can't make an America believe in anything. You cannot force an American to believe your faith, this faith, or any faith. The Americans are free to worship a pet rock if they want to. That's how free we are. And it makes the faith that we've chosen and others who have chosen a faith, it makes that choice all the richer, all the more meaningful, because we know it's unfettered. Nobody's pressuring us in any way. We'll certainly follow the wishes of our parents, but we're not going to rush out and tell everybody how they ought to believe. That's the brilliance of the framers. That's what they did. They what, what Robert Jackson did was look out over that mahogany bench and you know what he said to those kids? You obey your parents. This gives me goosebumps. In what other country would the Supremes come down from their highest, most powerful judicial perch and grab these kids who were standing, little William standing there, against an angry nation and there were people in that crowd that would have killed him. That's how, that's how despicable we felt they were for, for refusing to salute. And when, when it finally happened that these people were able to express themselves, we had one of the great, great decisions in the history of the United States Supreme Court. This is how noble we can be. Just one more. Lawrence v. Texas. Texas said you cannot have consensual sex in the privacy of your own home if you're gay. And cops would wait outside the adobe, the domicile of two gay people and they'd sit in the squad car. I mean, what's probable cause? Is it when the bedroom light is on or off? <laughs> and by the way, you can't get it. This is what, this is the hysteria that we are able to, actually our leaders are capable of. And by the way, how do you get in there? You gotta knock the door down, right? Probable cause, what? Knock the door down if you, you can't knock. You know, nobody, what are they gonna say? Interrupt whatever we may imagine them to be doing. Say, come in. You, the cops had to knock the door down. Rush into the bedroom of that flash. Okay, what's going on in here? 
What kind of country do you want? This got to the Supreme Court. Lawrence v. Texas. And Anthony Kennedy, a Catholic, by the way, said, speaking for the majority, offered these words to the nation and to the court. The petitioners are entitled to respect for their private lives. Think about this and think about being a proud American. The state cannot demean their existence or control their conduct or their destiny by making private sexual behavior a crime. Their right to liberty under the Due Process Clause gives them the full right to engage in their conduct without intervention of the government. It is a promise of the Constitution that there is a realm of personal liberty which the government may not enter. Oh, man. I mean, this is a great country. This is a great country. And when he read those words from the bench, the gay and lesbian lawyers who argued for the petition bowed their heads and softly wept. All those closets, all those years, all those muggings, all those dismissals from jobs, and the court finally came down and said, hold it, hold it. This is none of our business. And by the way, we still have two members of the Supreme Court who believe it is constitutionally permissible for a state to outlaw private sexual conduct. This is how close we have come to losing the heartbeat of this nation, that which we value the most. And by the way, let's review once more the fact that the United States now appears to be living in a world of pretense. It's as though if we say it, it's true. I, you know. Um, democracy, democracy, hell, less than half of us vote. The troops, the troops, oh, the troops are so brave, the troops, the troops are so glorious. Thank God for the troops, the troops, the troops come home and the VA doesn't call them back. That's pretense. Stop talking to ourselves like this. And we're never going to get rid of pretense until we get rid of the most important one. Draft the rich. <laughs> you know, you know, if your father could afford the lawyer, you didn't have to serve in Vietnam. We can never let this happen again. Everybody will sacrifice on the next war unless we, unless we're, we remain silent. It'll go as usual. Only the poor kids will go, the working class kids, the kids that think they're gonna get a college education if they go. And we're gonna find ourselves in another quagmire, another terrible, terrible, world problem that we unleashed. I mean, nobody likes us. This isn't funny. This puts our kids at risk and our grandchildren. They're going to have to pick up the pieces of this radical grab for power that we see taking place before our very eyes. So it's our job. We're the nominees to get this done. Who else is going to get it done? And by the way, you know, we're popular now. We're going to have a little difficulty getting used to this. We are the majority opinion. We were before it happened, and we are now. People have come to see the value of the contribution we tried to make at the time this war was called. 
Now is the time. We have, this nation has silenced half the political voice in this country. You, you, speaking out was a contact sport there for a while. And it should never happen again. And with your help, it never will. That's why it's a thrill to be here and be surrounded by people who share these values. We are not alone. Let us avoid cynicism. If we start to think the problem is the rock of Gibraltar and we're a feather, then we're going to collapse and we're not going to do anything. We're going to just, what, take guitar lessons <laughs> or yoga lessons. We're not going to keep on keeping on. And over the years with my show, that's where, this, that's where the saints are made. You know, everybody can go out and wave their arm for a weekend. But the people who go back, the people who continue to speak to empty chairs, by the way, there's a lot of those people here with us this afternoon, the people who understand how complicated this is, how difficult this is, what a long climb up the hill this is, and keep on keeping on anyway. Those are the Americans. Those are the saints among us. Those are the people who are going to save us from people who know what's good for us and don't want us to in any way dissent or fool around with their brilliant decisions. Never, never again will we allow this to happen. In, um, 19, in, eight, in 2002, <clears throat> the United States Congress passed the Iraq War Resolution. Only 23 senators voted no. Out of 23 senators voted no. That's, by the way, every shout show in October 2002 supported the war. Every newspaper supported the war. The generals were coming, we didn't know it then, were coming from Rumsfeld's office and acting like objective experts on all the cable channels. They were reading the talking points of the Pentagon. And the, and the Congress was reading the talking points of the White House. A smoking gun will become a mushroom cloud. I mean, those were written by the White House to scare the people, and it worked. It worked. We rushed out into a horrible, horrible mess of a, of a foreign policy decision that has left over a million Iraqis dead. Four million refugees and over 4,000 Americans, who, by the way, came home in coffins that we weren't allowed to take pictures of. The president said, you can't take these pictures, and the entire mainstream press said, okay. No blowback, no bite, no sticking their nose under the tent to see what the righteous have in store for us. None of that. None of that. Just quiet acquiescence in the land of free speech. How bad is this? How bad is this when you can't stand up? And by the way, there were millions of people out there who thought this war was a terrible idea, but we never heard from them. And we never, ever see the pain of this war. This is the most sanitized war of my lifetime. Less than 5% of us have sacrificed for this war. And I got a tax cut. There is no pain with this war. The administration made sure of that. The only pain is the pain that's going to be left as these young men and women come home with PTSD. The men are the ones that are going to beat up their girlfriends. Alcohol will get them. You can't send anybody to a battle theater four times, three and four times. They come back different. They just are. They're different and often volatile. This is, the, this is the feature of war that we don't see or hear about. And a VA system that passes out pills rather than take the time to diagnose the injury and treat it with care and respect. 
This is what we are. This is where we find ourselves in 2008. And I want you to know that I, for one, I feel, believe it or not, confident. I think we can make this happen. I think we can change America. And Now, I want to take you back to October 2002, the, the Iraq War Resolution. Now, re imagine, imagine, this is three weeks before an election. Imagine standing up and saying no to this war. 23 senators did, and 133 members of the House, in one of the great acts of moral courage of my lifetime, stood up and said no. And by the way, a good piece of the Wisconsin delegation was part of this. And I'm going to read you the names of these people. The clerk will call the roll, and you will announce their vote. October 2002, the clerk is calling the roll. Ms. Baldwin, no. no. Mr. Barrett, no. Mr. Kletzka, no. Mr. Obi, no. and finally, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Feingold. We're not dead yet. We haven't rolled over yet. And you've made this a wonderful afternoon for a kid from New York. I want to tell you, I'm coming back here. I met a lot of nice people. Let's change America and bring us home to the vision of the framers. We can do it. Thank you all. I had a fabulous time. Thank you very much.